Okay, so today on the show, it's a very rare, rare thing today that I have a guest actually in person, physically right beside me. It's Mr. Keith Elliott Greenberg, best-selling author in New York. And we're here to talk about his new book today, Follow the Buzzards. Keith, first of all, thanks for meeting up with me. We're here in lovely Dublin. We are. How are you enjoying your time here first? I'm loving it here. I mean, this is, I think, my fifth time that I've been in Ireland. And uh, I always have a good time here. I have, uh, even though I'm not of Irish ancestry, I have deep Irish connections uh, based on the fact that in New York City, a lot of Irish immigrants uh, came over about now close to four decades ago. And some of those folks became my dear friends. And so I was over in the UK promoting the book and it just made sense to visit visit some people, touch base with some people over here in the Emerald Isle. And I've been having a great time the way I always do. And my hair's a little messed up, but it was a late night in Dublin last yeah. night. Did you have a few Guinnesses last night? Uh, I didn't have Guinness. I'm I'm not a Guinness drinker. I actually drink Carlsberg, which is not an Irish beer. That's my drink. Isn't yeah, it? but I really enjoy Carlsberg. And for some reason, when I'm over on this side of the Atlantic, uh, the Carlsberg seems to taste a little better. Yeah. I had Carlsberg when I was in Dallas because it's not very easy getting American. But no, we, it's not. We yeah. found a UK bar and I can tell you it wasn't the same. Yeah, it's it's not quite the same. Yeah. So you've been on tour with Inside the Ropes. Where have you been? Um, well, I um, I tagged along. I'm, I'm a monthly columnist for Inside the Ropes magazine. And for anyone who doesn't read it, it's a great magazine. It's the a throwback to the newsstand wrestling magazines of times past. And I was uh, humbled and honored to be asked to do a monthly column for them. And they're part of the wider Inside the Ropes franchise where they um, stage um, basically question and answer sessions with legends of the squared circle. So uh, when I found out that William Regal was doing two events, and then Rob Van Dam was doing an event in London. I decided to sell some books. Oh, I'm not supposed to say I sold some books. I decided to sign some books. <laughs> and um, so I started out in Glasgow, and uh, the, the publisher, ECW Press, was a bit nervous that if they shipped the books, they wouldn't arrive over here in time. Yeah. So I ended up just hauling 40 books over to the UK. And by the second night, I'd sold most of them. And then I still had a show in London. So I had to stash a few. And then, of course, there's the book I promised you. So uh, I would start out in Glasgow. I ended up in Manchester. And oh, no, ultimately, I, I started out in Glasgow, continued on to Manchester, ended up in London and now I'm here in Dublin. Yeah. And in the way the show works, then what way did you get to sell the books? Were you like in the hallways? Or exactly. Yeah. It's just like if you're at an indie wrestling show, um, you walk in and they're selling the merchandise that's relevant to the event. And then you go to the next table and I'm there. Yeah. And at one point I was in Manchester and I said to somebody, Oh, you interested in, you know, in, in having a book. And he starts reaching into his pocket and just hands me 20 pounds. And I'm like, don't you want to see, see the cover first? Like, don't you want to know what the book is like? But, you know, it was, I never went into sales, but if sales was that easy, who knows, maybe I would have been that instead of a writer. <laughs> and did you get to meet many people over in the UK then that you've worked yeah, with? Yeah, I've gotten to meet people who I've worked with, people from inside the ropes. There's also a great team that, uh, uh, the the uh, founder of the Inside the Ropes franchise, uh, Kenny McIndush, has surrounded himself with. Uh, there's Fiona, there's Jen, there's Ollie, there's Louise. And, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time with those people before, both on this side and in the U.S. at wrestling events. And, um, you know, it's uh, it was it's been pretty cool to be around those people. And uh, it was also great to uh, meet some people who've been reading my work, like one guy said to me, he goes, wow, I've been reading your stuff since I was a little kid. And at first I'm like, what do you mean a little kid? What are you saying? I'm an old man, but you know, I've been doing this for over 30 years. So yeah, it makes sense. 
Well, you know, my first book, Too Sweet Inside, not the, my first book, the, the first book of this series, yeah. uh, Too Sweet Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution, uh, traces the history of independent uh, wrestling, really going back to the early 60s and culminating in the first broadcast of Dynamite. And when I finished that book, I realized this is not the end of the story. This is um, just the end of a chapter and the book screamed for a sequel. Uh, so, you know, I was curious to see how it all shape out. I mean, the first year of Dynamite, I thought, will Dynamite exist in a year? Will AEW exist in a year? Will they overtake WWE? You know, there were a lot of question marks. What happens to the Indies, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, as, I, as I was finishing up the epilogue of Too Sweet, uh, the World Health Organization declared an international pandemic. And now we were looking at uh, a WrestleMania in an empty performance center. And uh, we were looking at empty arena shows and New Japan canceled uh, wrestling for several months. And I said to my executive editor, Michael Holmes, we have to do a book about pro wrestling during the COVID era. And so that's what this book is about. But in answer to your question, I think pro wrestling, at least in the U.S., is going through a golden age. Uh, you have two very viable promotions. And I will say, I even think WWE, the fact that the Triple H era has begun, has made WWE remarkably better. It's brought freshness to WWE. It's something long overdue. And for all the controversy that we read about online about AEW, the fans are watching because it's exciting stuff. The stuff behind the scenes is exciting. Adversity breeds strength. Mm -hmm. And um, the matches in the ring are good. They have a good in-ring product. Yeah, you can find certain flaws in both products. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's easy to find the couple of things in AEW that don't seem as polished as WWE. But you go to a great indie and it's the same thing. So I think it's a good period to be a wrestling fan. The one thing that I didn't like about AEW, I won't say I didn't like about it, but the one thing that couldn't grab me into it was like the production quality from a TV point of view mm. when you were like putting WWE and AEW side by side. But that's slowly changing now and it looks physically better, I think. Well, I think everything that we're seeing now, and this goes back to Follow the Buzzards, my new book, has to be looked at in the context of what happened during the COVID era, because everybody went back to square one. It's like, how do you present a good wrestling show? And AEW uh, uh, placed wrestlers in the audience because they couldn't allow fans in to act like a studio wrestling crowd. And I mm -hmm. thought it was quite effective. Mm -hmm. WWE tried a few things, you know, you'd watch NXT and there'd be, or Raw, and there'd be trainees from the performance center positioned behind plexiglass in a dark uh, arena, and it didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. And then WWE created the Thunderdome, and they spent a lot of money to create the Thunderdome. Yeah. And the Thunderdome, after a while, after they got through their technical glitches, I found myself forgetting that it wasn't a live crowd. Of course, it wasn't a live crowd, but we were in the middle of COVID-19. So was able to forget how locked down everything was. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think they both developed their, their the production values we see today as they went. And that was inevitable, yeah. just like we vaulted our lifestyles over the last couple of years. Yeah, I think the two big wrestling companies can kind of be proud of the way that they were able to continue during this and just kind of fly a flag for sports really as well. Yeah, well, fly a flag for sports and entertainment to yeah. use the term, you know, sports entertainment. Um, they did set the tone on how to present a product that helped give people release during a very anxious time. And who do you think came out of it better? Or do you think they both came out of it stronger for AW and WWE? Well, it? you know, and I mentioned this in the book. Um, in the beginning, uh, right before uh, COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, 
AEW was planning to go into New York. They were going into the Northeast. They were going after, you know, the, the, the center point of WWE, the place that, you know, Jess McMahon first started promoting wrestling more than a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. So they were going right to WWE where they live. Yeah. Um, that was suspended when everything was locked down. So that had to be put in, on pause. Um, but they did recover and they did go into all those places as planned. Uh, I was at the first Grand Slam and I was also at the second Grand Slam, which was in Queens, New York. And uh, the first one was unlike anything I'd ever witnessed for a promotion in the New York area outside of um, WWE. Now, I was at the Ring of Honor New Japan show. That was pretty exciting. This was a larger crowd and the New Japan Ring of Honor show was pretty, pretty great. Um, but the intensity of that crowd, there was this feeling, there was almost this feeling like AEW had won the wrestling war. Now, going back there a year later, they drew about 13,000 fans. They haven't won the wrestling war. Uh, WWE is the market leader and will remain so. I mean, they have a 35-year head start. Mm. I think both promotions are doing well, but let's not forget the indies. Yes. Uh, Game Changer Wrestling is doing very well. Um, we were just talking about uh, OTT here in Ireland. You know, uh, ICW in Scotland. Uh, you know, Rev Pro, these promotions are still drawing their fans and their fans are just as passionate. It might, they may not be as passionate as they were, say, during a certain period when people were falling in love with it. But like AEW, they have a loyal fan base and it's not like the pandemic ended and those fans had evaporated. Yeah, yeah. And for people that are going to buy this book, what kind of what promotions are featured in this across the world? Well, um, I uh, include obviously WWE and AEW. Yeah, GCW is a big part of it. GCW gave me a lot of access during the pandemic. They were doing outdoor shows where people could be segregated into pods. Uh, you know, I was backstage. I saw how you know the wrestlers were taking their own temperatures backstage and there were uh, sanitizing stations and people were masked. At one point I was at a GCW show and someone told me to pull up my mask after I took a drink of something. And um, so they're obviously in there. And then there's promotions that you might not have heard of, um, which I always like to do in my books. Uh, there's a promotion in San Diego, California called Fist. And they were doing drive-in shows where, you know, and it was so clandestine that the fans would be told online to drive to a certain point. And then um, on an FM transmitter, the promoter, everyone would tune their radios to a certain spot on the dial. And the promoter would say, okay, we're going behind that boarded up supermarket and there'd be a ring set up. And people were encouraged to stay around their cars and not rush the ring, which is, you know, revolutionary and innovative for a very small promotion. I uh, spoke to a promoter in Finland who, during the pandemic, uh, expanded into Estonia. And he also uh, did a show in a, like, basically an oil tank. And so even though it was an empty arena show, you could hear that echo when the guys were hitting each other mm. and when the guys were, you know, coming off the ropes and landing. So it created a certain effect. And so, again, that could take you out of the fact that everything's locked down. And I also spoke to these, um, th these promoters in, in Denmark, and they spoke to me a lot about the Danish wrestling scene, which is very small. And I knew nothing about. So again, I try to, and of course, New Japan is covered. Uh, Noah is covered. So, you know, I try to cast as wide a net as possible. Now, look, the wrestling world is vast and there's no way 
I was able to capture everything. Yeah. So my goal, which I believe I met, was to uh, take a snapshot of the pro wrestling world during the COVID era. And that meant the big promotions and that meant the small promotions. And if somebody looks back 20 or 25 years from now, I'm fairly confident that they'll say, I accomplished that goal. What was the most revolutionary thing you've seen from the business over COVID? I mean, look, the, the um, well, WrestleMania in the performance center was, I don't know if it was revolutionary. It was those cinematic matches. Those the cinematic styles, matches. Styles see, and Undertaker. see, this yeah. was the thing. Yeah. There had been cinematic matches before. There yeah. was the, uh, the boiler room. Yeah. Brawl. There was the, the fight between uh, Goldust and Piper during the OJ Simpson case oh, yeah. where they were <laughs> going crazy, down the yeah. highway in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, you know, so this isn't brand new. I mean, years back, Terry Funk and Jerry Lawler had an empty arena match. Uh, but the cinematic match became a staple of the wrestling business. And, uh, you know, like if you looked at WrestleMania 36, you had the Boneyard match between The Undertaker and AJ Styles. And that was like a, an American Western. And then you had. Really enjoyed um, it. And yeah. And then you had Bray Wyatt and John Cena. And that was like an art house movie. That was like a movie where you think you were hallucinating. Yeah. So these are two very different types of genres. Yeah. And say what you want about Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon obviously approved both. Yeah. And that was pretty cool. Uh, the stadium stampede that AEW did yeah. was, you know, the Khan family happens to own a football stadium. And they use that stadium yeah. for not only a very exciting match, a very funny match. Uh, that had a lot of daring in it as well. Um, you know, you had, again, then you had uh, in GCW, uh, when they were raising money for wrestlers who were sidelined, they had a social distancing match yeah. between Joey Janela and Jimmy Lloyd, which was deliberately ridiculous. And the two combatants were required to stay six feet away from each other. And the referee, Chris Levin, even had a tape measure. Yeah. And then, you know, Jimmy Lloyd said to me in the book, usually we're trying to make all the blows look real. Now we were trying to make everything look fake. So one guy would uh, make a hip toss motion and the other guy would yeah. take the bump. Yeah. And at one point, Joey Janela was about to go through a door positioned against the turnbuckles and he pulled out a sanitary wipe wiped the door down and then threw himself through the door. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing that a lot of people online were okay, well, on it or whatever. And, and that's in the book too. Yeah. You know, it's funny cause I read one review and the person said, Keith obviously doesn't like Jim Cornette because I quote Jim Cornette throughout the book, criticizing things of that nature. Mm -hmm. That's not true. I actually love Jim Cornette. I remember when he was at WWE, he was, an extremely knowledgeable guy to interview. I listen to his podcast uh, and I think he's, um, you know, a treasure of the business and he should be in the hall of fame. But I quoted him bashing things, both, you know, political things and things that were going on in wrestling. And I thought it was important to include that voice and it had nothing to do with like or dislike. In fact, I felt fortunate that he was adding color to this era by criticizing so many things. Yeah, so Jim Cornette, he's very black and white, but like we were talking off camera about the internet these days and people, everyone has an opinion, everyone is a journalist, everyone's a wrestling journalist. He's a man that's entitled to have an opinion. Oh, certainly, look at what experience. he's accomplished. Look at, you know, look, look at his, his, the wealth of his work. And he has every right to assess the wrestling business. And if you don't agree with him, well, that's okay. I mean, diversity makes the world go round. I mean, you know, it's funny, like another thing that uh, that we saw that you ne might not have seen in the non-COVID era was that song and dance routine with MJF and Chris Jericho. Yeah. At the time, I was thoroughly entertained. And the fact that Jim Cornette was revolted by it as, <laughs> 
we could have predicted made it even funnier. Yeah, yeah. That MJF guy, just, uh, I see him, I've seen videos and clips of him doing autograph sessions and everything. He's never out of character. I think it's fantastic. Well, it's very interesting because MJF's mother and I went to the same high school at the same time. I don't remember ever having a conversation with her in high school, uh, but we, um, my best friend went out with one of her friends. So we were undoubtedly like in the same place at the same time on several occasions. And um, when MJF had left AEW during that period, mm -hmm. I'd occasionally go on the mother's Facebook page and you would have thought she didn't have a son. Like there were pictures of her husband and her friends and her daughters. So she was kayfabing as much as he was. Yeah, yeah. He probably doesn't, and I know a lot of people in the business don't like putting their families and their right. families don't want to put up photos because mm. you have these crazy but no now people. there's photos of him oh, okay like when he got engaged recently she threw that stuff up right away right yeah yeah did you ever meet the guy you know when i was writing uh too sweet inside the indie wrestling revolution i was in a, at an mlw show and you know this was before AEW, and i was uh trying to interview people who I perceived as indie stars or potential indie stars. And I was interviewing um, Brian Pillman Jr. Yeah. and Teddy Hart. And uh, I also was interviewing Tommy Dreamer in the dressing room. At one point, like MJF and Sammy Guevara were kind of standing around and like looking over at me, like, are you going to interview us? Which I would have liked to. But then like the show was starting and I left and I didn't know who was going to be become the next uh, superstar. So, you know, I contented myself with the people I had. Yeah, I'm sure your, your paths will cross at some point. I mean, again. yes, I'm sure they will. Uh, for people watching this that didn't see our last podcast, uh, do you want to just briefly go into when you were working in WWE, what you were doing there with the magazine? Um, so I was at WWE Magazine on as a, on retainer which i never worked in the office i was mm -hmm. never a full-time staff employee but i began writing for the wwe magazine or wwf magazine uh in 1985 shortly after wrestlemania one and i uh was a you know writer for them for 22 years and even after well while i was there I co-wrote the autobiographies of Ric Flair and Freddie Blassie and superstar Billy Graham. And even after I no longer had a retainer there, they still once in a while bring me on for certain projects. And I co-wrote uh, two editions of the WWE Encyclopedia. And, um, you know, I also co-wrote the unpublished book of The Iron Sheik, which is a, 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 a podcast unto itself. Mm. And I'm in a WWE production for A&E about the Iron Sheik that's coming up. I'm also in the uh, Iron Sheik documentary that occurred a few years ago. So I never had a falling out with WWE, yeah. which I'm very happy about. So once in a while I'm being interviewed and people want me to bash WWE. And why should I do that? Yeah, yeah. And we talked before about Vince and you told me a great story last time about those three ladies that he gave. Yes, you know, and, and, and when they say Vince and the three ladies, this is not no, no, a pejorative is... Vince McMahon <laughs> story. This is, you know, I saw Vince McMahon when the company was a lot smaller and I saw him be very kind to fans. And I saw Stephanie be very kind to fans when she was, you know, kind of gaining her footing in the business and Shane. And I remember there were these three sisters who were at a lot of shows and they seemed a little socially awkward. And we all were out to dinner after a show in, uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York. Hulk Hogan was there. I mean, this is how intimate it was. Hulk Hogan was sitting there. I was sitting there. Um, and these three fans were there. And Vince McMahon uh, handed these women lifetime passes to any WWE show and they cried. And, you know, when people talk about Vince McMahon, that's the side of Vince McMahon that a lot of people don't know about. Maybe it's from the Mr. McMahon character that he played. 
maybe it has to do with the fact that he he was so successful that people think he's as evil as what they've seen on TV. So a lot of people will say and write things about Vince McMahon, but I guess they don't know him. Only the people that have worked with him closely over the years will know him. And you're one of those. Do you ever do you have any stories about him working hands on closely with you? Uh, no, but I'll, I'll say this. Um, Vince would know everything that was going on. Uh, Cage Nakayama, who I, I can tell the story now because he's retired, but he was one of my best friends. Still, I consider him one of my best friends. He was a photographer for one of the weekly full color or uh, color Japanese wrestling magazines. Um, the, part of the magazine was in black and white, but um, the, you know, there'd be pages in both the front end and the back end in color. And um, we were in Las Vegas and Cage decided to bring a girlfriend to the show. And after the show, uh, they were about to leave. You know, Cage was in the, uh, the girlfriend was in the audience and um, Cage walked into the dressing room at, at area and he brought the girlfriend with him. And Vince McMahon was talking to a group of people. And as Cage walked by with the girlfriend, Vince, while he was in mid conversation, just kind of gave Cage a look. He looked at the girlfriend and he looked at Cage to send the message like, okay, you're bringing your girlfriend backstage. Don't think I don't see this. And I heard stories like, um, you know, a ring attendant would wipe down a barricade uh, because someone threw a beer or a soda. And Vince McMahon would say, by the way, I saw you were right on top of it. You wiped down that barricade and that's great because there wasn't a glare like I was afraid there would be. So that's how, how much attention to detail he would play. Yeah. And of course, we were talking as well and we said a lot of things have changed even in the first half of this year. Enough for, you could write nearly two books on it, but obviously there's going to be beginning, middle and end to all this kind right. of stuff. Yeah. So what do you think of the new direction of WWE under Triple H? It's like, it's subtle changes, isn't it? It's not... Well, and the, but, they, but they have also brought back a lot of talent. Yeah. You know, you have Hit Row is back. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Johnny Gargano is back. You have Dexter Loomis, uh, you know, back, but, yeah, yeah. he's a great character. And, you know, it, it kind of, you know, kills me to think what would have happened uh, in terms of our personal entertainment had Dexter Loomis been cut off from WWE and then he'd have to come up with a new character. So, um, you know, all these fun, Braun Strowman is back. Yeah, and he looks great. And he looks great. Yeah, yeah and... Um, it's interesting because I don't know if you ever read inside the Ropes magazine, but there's a friend of mine who's a columnist there, Sandra Ruth. And um, she commented in her recent column, she, she would have liked to have seen him beat a very competent wrestler than beat a, a tag team in some of those matches. You know, he's so overwhelming, but that's the role he's always played. Mm. So, um, you know, it's exciting to see those people come back. And that's not subtle. That's pretty, um, I wouldn't say over the top, but it's a loud declaration. Like Triple H is in charge now, and these people might have been let go, mm -hmm. but they're here again because he had a plan for them, and now that plan continues. And I think we'll probably be seeing more changes. The thing that we have to watch, though, is this is the honeymoon period yes. for the Triple H era. And, you know, in the not too distant past, it was Tony Khan's honeymoon period. Mm -hmm. And now people online seem to um, derive this tremendous joy in mocking Tony Khan. And hey, it's lonely at the top. He's the boss. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. And there will come a, a reckoning period where people will start to criticize WWE again. And then things will sort themselves out. So, you know, people have said, oh, you must be working on your next book. And I'm like, I think I want to waste. I want to see what happens in wrestling because there's so much uncertainty there. And when I was writing the book about wrestling during COVID, I was writing as things were unfolding, which was difficult yeah. because I prefer writing with the luxury of hindsight. And I just couldn't do that or I never would have made my deadline. And you know, when I look at 
other books that are currently coming out. A lot of those books also deal with the COVID-19 era. So I needed that book to come out now, not five years from now. Although I would say five years from now, when you read this book, it will again give you a sense of history at that time. Yeah. And of course, there's a man here kind of outlined on the cover as well that it looks it looks to be uh, Mr. Bray Wyatt, and there seems to be a lot of buzz around him at the moment. Yeah, as well. well, yes, and you know, it's a representation of mm -hmm. someone who may or may, may not like be inspired by Bray Wyatt, mm -hmm. and he's wearing a mask. And um, you know, we discussed that. Um, the idea was the mask and the gloves would be surgical blue. But you said that there's a lot of buzz around uh, Bray Wyatt, which is great because the book is Follow the Buzzards based <laughs> Buzz, Buzzards, but it's based on uh, a Bray Wyatt term that yeah. he used in a promo. And Follow the Buzzards was something that in the COVID era, you know, would follow the buzzards. It's like the buzzards were circling overhead. Um, and that's when wrestling is at its best sometimes, is when we're not sure what's real and what's not real. You know, we're suspending our disbelief, but then there's elements that are 100% authentic there. And right now, as of this day, we don't know where Bray Wyatt is ending up. Or we don't know if he's really coming into WWE, nor do we know about Sasha Banks. And I must say, it's pretty exciting to speculate. Yeah, yeah. And it's especially satisfying now that I'm not on retainer for WWE because when I was on retainer for them, sometimes they tell me in advance what looked to be happening. And uh, as a fan, I didn't always want to know that. Spoilers. Yeah, it's spoilers, yeah. And of course, Cody came back as well. Yes. And unfortunately got sidelined with an injury. But, but he'll be back. He'll be back. Yeah. I, I think he'll be back around Royal Rumble time, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. Do you see a big future for him now? Certainly. Yeah, certainly. I don't think he would have been brought back. And I think that whatever issues he might have had with Triple H have likely been patched up. Mm. I think. Has um, he done the thing with the throne, remember? Yes, I was there. Him. Yes, yeah. where he smashed the throne. What did was, you think of that when you seen it? I was there live uh, with with Kenny McIntosh, and I was sitting next to Bill Apter. Mm. And, um, you know, this was before... Dynamite was on TV. It was the first AEW pay-per-view. And he was sending a pretty clear signal like he was smashing his past. Mm. But I guess in pro wrestling, you never really smash the past because he came back. It was like all these years, uh, the ultimate warrior was yeah. Vince's mortal enemy. And then he came back and Vince put him in the Hall of Fame. I remember like every time I would monitor the WWE Hall of Fame, I would, uh, you know, think it's not a legitimate Hall of Fame because Bruno San Martino's not in there. Mm -hmm. And then 2013, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So even though there was all this animosity between Vince McMahon and Bruno San Martino, they hugged and they apparently reconciled. And, um, you know, nothing is forever in wrestling, including apparent hatred. Yeah. And I think maybe that's going to be a trait that Triple H inherits from Vince McMahon because obviously they would have had discussions around Cody coming back and certainly and Triple certainly. H would have known about their troll smash and all uh, he, I, I'm sure he knew that as it was happening yeah. uh having spent a little bit of time around Triple H in the past my guess is that he watched it live yeah 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 and he probably would sense some element of respect from it as well because you have to remember when Triple H and Shawn Michaels went to WCW on the army tank and all that kind of right. stuff. It all comes full circle. Right, yeah, I, I think business. he understands, right, it's, it's show business. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was acting as if he was burning a bridge, and at the time he may have been sincere about that. And you're right, I think there probably is some professional respect, and you give someone a little zinger, and, you know, maybe uh, that means you're a little tougher and a little you have a little more fortitude than uh, others may have realized. Yeah, and plus, if he hadn't have done it and went on that big run in AEW, he probably wouldn't even be back in WWE at this point. So just, I mean, who knows? Yeah, yeah, it's weird the way the world works. Yes. Um, in terms of yourself, then, for the book, uh, what's coming up in terms of signings and different bits and pieces? Well, um, thank you for asking that. Uh, fortunately, this is going to be up on the uh, web uh, before 
my New York release party, which is the big bash that's uh, associated with the book. Uh, for everybody listening in the New York metropolitan area, Thursday night, October 13th, I will have my New York book release party. Everyone out there is invited. That is at Lucky 13 in Brooklyn. Lucky 13 is known as New York City's only metal bikini bar. And uh, when you go there, you will see what we mean. And I, you know, everyone's invited. So if you're around Thursday, October 13th, starting at 8 p.m., come to my book release party. And then two days later, October 15th, I will be signing books at the Wrestling Universe in Queens, which is a, a great pro wrestling merchandise store. And it's also walking distance from where I grew up. So I have DDT, which is the best themed wrestling bar in the world, walking distance from my current home in Brooklyn. And I have uh, the Wrestling Universe walking distance from my childhood home in Queens. And as you see, I don't really extend a wide net for myself because it's Brooklyn and Queens, but here I am in Dublin. <laughs> and of course, there's a A and E documentaries coming out as well. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm on. Um, yeah, I've been on a couple of the A and E documentaries, uh, WWE documentaries. There's some more coming out, and I've also been interviewed for several of the uh, documentaries that WWE is doing for Peacock. And I believe I'm supposed to do another yes i'm supposed to be interviewed for another wwe documentary this week mm -hmm. and also before we go inside the ropes yes inside the ropes uh inside the ropes magazine i'm a monthly columnist for them um it's a fantastic newsstand wrestling magazine you can order it by subscription or you can you know even better if you're in the uk pick it up at a wh smith's or one of those stores. You can actually get it down the road here in Easton's in Ireland as well. Either, which is pretty great. Yeah. And then, um, you know, in the uh, United States, there's a delay of a few weeks, but it can be found at Barnes and Noble, or you can subscribe. And it's a real all-star team of writers uh, from over here. You have the great Irish writer, Finlay Martin. Yeah. You have me, you have Brian Solomon who wrote the best book of 2022, the best uh, pro wrestling book of 2022. And I always say, if it wasn't for my friend, Brian, I would have written the best wrestling book of 2022. <laughs> but his book on the original Sheik, it's exhaustive. It gives you insight into a very mysterious man. And it's as researched as anything I've ever read. And for people to follow you then on social media, where's the best place to get you? Well, I'm almost up to 5,000 friends on Facebook. I think there's like 13 left. So the room is nearly full. The room is nearly full, but um, you can also, but it's Keith Elliott Greenberg. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Twitter. You will find me. I do have a social media presence and that's what I've been largely using to promote this book. This and, you know, podcasts like yours. Yeah. Before we go, what is your favorite, Kindle or physical copy? Physical copy. But, yeah. you know, that, that may be a symptom of my age. Now, <laughs> I was discussing the book with uh, Rob Van Dam a few uh, nights ago, and he's 100% a Kindle guy. And oh, really? He, and he ordered the book on Kindle as we were chatting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Keith, absolute pleasure to catch up with you today. And pleasure. hopefully our paths will cross in person. I, again, I, so. I imagine they will. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to be in Ireland to everyone watching uh, around the Emerald Isle. We might go have a pint of Carlsberg now. I think we are. <laughs>